there were 40 days in between the time that Jesus resurrected and the time that he ascended publicly in the which days Jesus began a capacity building program there was one thing that was obvious and what was obvious was the, the in, incompetence of the functionaries that would be saddled to the responsibility of extending the frontiers of the kingdom of God so Jesus decided to dedicate those 40 days interval between his resurrection and his ascension to carry out training capacity building to increase the understanding of these functionaries that will be saddled with the responsibility of kingdom advancement the book of acts is the manifestation of a different regime in the administration of the economy of god uh, there, there were previous things that God did leading up to this critical moment that would define whether or not the body of Christ will have the capacity to fulfill that global enterprise of witness that Jesus was calling her into. The Bible says that Jesus began both to do and to teach. It will surprise you that the entire content of the book of Luke, it was distilled and what came out of that volume in summary was the things that Jesus began first of all to do and then what to teach the doing that was spoken about is the preoccupation of living a life that is utterly obedient to the will of God Jesus will make statements like I am not capable in myself I have not come here to be creative what I've come to do is to find out what my father is doing and I plug in to become an administrative infrastructure to achieving that which my father is doing. It means that Jesus' work is dependent on his father's work. Jesus only walks in the direction that his father is walking and Jesus will not walk if his father does not walk. Anytime you see Jesus doing something, it's because it has been articulated in the spirit that his father is doing something. See, in, in modern day church, modern day Christian philosophy, because we have set schedules, even if God is not saying anything, the pastor must preach on Sunday morning, but not Jesus. Jesus will do nothing if his father is not at work. So the way we know Jesus' father is at work is when he begins to do something. Then we know that, okay, it is because he saw that his father was busy and he has articulated the kind of effort that his father is putting in place that is what informs his own action so the Bible reveals that the secret of the teaching ministry of Jesus was drawn from his preoccupation in the in the act of obeying God and it will interest you to know that Jesus had a spoken ministry that lasted for three and a half years but he had an obedience ministry which was for three decades so 10 years of obedience to one year of preaching think about it the things Jesus did that we call his ministry were done in practical life situations maybe somebody somebody died and they are just going there's a procession people are weeping going for burial then he just shows up and says, oh, stand up stand up okay then he, he moves up that's that that's what we call his ministry he had no pulpit where he was preaching because the pulpits belong to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The people that must preach every Tuesday, those days, were the Pharisees. They had, they had a system for ministry. Jesus had no system, no place in that system. So his own ministry was captured in practical life circumstances. Jesus was not looking for pulpits. He was looking for people. If you study the Old Testament, you, you will realize that the description of a prophet in those days was not a preacher. It was someone that was in custody of the counsel of God. And any time the technocrats in government stumbled on situations that were beyond their capacities in education, they switched into spiritual knowledge because of the presence of the prophets in those territories. Prophets had seats in the place of government to bring the dimensions of heaven and the perspective of heaven into governance and nation building. There were no pulpit people. Now, if we take the pulpit from your life, what is left? If nothing is left, it means you did not.
not fulfill your quota of obedience before you began to teach. There was no doing in your own life. Your life just began with teaching. And that's why your teaching doesn't have enough authority to transform, to change, to pierce the soul of a nation. He had no pulpit. When he encounters his father in the place of prayer, he goes to the water side and he looks for someone who can lend him his boat because he wants to talk. After that service, if you come to the water side tomorrow, you will not see him. <laughs> you will not see him. The reason why he was that fluid was because for him, it was more about obedience than talking. So anywhere the father was, that's where you will find Jesus. If, if the father moves, Jesus will move. But we will die with the microphone in our hands. When obedience becomes a critical factor in the dispensing of ministry, you, you, you will be fluid. You, even you yourself, your life will so change. Yes, once upon a time in my own practice of ministry, this pulpit, I left it. The one, the ministry I pioneered, I left it for 11 years. Who does that? Yes, I left it for 11 years. And I became an intercessor for 11 years. Left pulpit to pray. If it's about obedience, you will not follow the normal pattern. <laughs> if it's about obedience, you will not have the contemporary description of how people see a preacher. If you are regimented, restricted, and rooted, it means that you are a professional. You are not into obedience. You are a professional preacher. So the book of Acts begins by revealing to us the secret of this man called Jesus. That all he did was that he began to do then he now taught. So when I began to understand some of these things, I began to weigh my life, my life of obedience. What errand are you running for Jesus? Is there an errand you are running? Is there a mission that Jesus committed to you that is the description of your life? Or you are trying to blend in, you are trying to to get views on Facebook, you are trying to get likes, you are trying to trend. And in this day, people are ashamed of being who they are in the place of obedience because it will contradict what is fashionable, it will contradict what is trending. They don't want to earn a name of being outside of the box or swimming against the tide. But Jesus swam against the tide all through his spoken ministry. He was not in conformity with the concept of spirituality in that was established in his time. He brought the reason why he was that fluid was because his undercurrent was obedience. Right. So the, the evangelist begins by telling us, giving us an executive summary of the texture of the kind of service delivery that Jesus made available. And he said, Jesus continued that until the day he was taken up. So if you read that correctly, you will find out that there is no room for retirement, actually. Check, go and read Hebrew. Check the Hebrew lexicon, check the Hebrew dictionary. There is one word you will not find in the Hebrew dictionary. It's called, there are two words. One of them is retirement. You know why? Because you don't retire from obeying God. Yeah, you don't. You won't find retirement. I'm challenging you to go and check. You won't find retirement in the Hebrew lexicon. It's not there. There are two words, but I, one of them is retirement. The Bible says that he began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up. Are you there? That was his preoccupation. That was the errand that he was sent to accomplish. And that errand stemmed out of a consistent life that was deliberate and intentional with obedience. And that became the basis of the authority that was in his spoken ministry. The Bible says that when this capacity building seminar was put together, Jesus gave commandments unto the apostles that he had chosen. Listen to me. Even though this seminar was free, you need to pay a gate fee to access the things that Jesus wanted to teach, but it was not available to the public. In order for you to partake of this, Jesus will need to choose you. It's not as if I'm willing. I, no, 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 no. 
there was a meticulous process of choosing who will be a partaker of this instruction are you with me you know why he admitted them by something that was deliberate was because when they were eventually chosen he began to give them commandments you see uh, there is a difference between what happened here and what happens in a lecture when you attend the lecture the lecturer is dispensing knowledge but when you come for a kingdom cantonment jesus gives commandments you, see, you know it's uh, it's different from just a lecture where information is dispensed knowledge is dispensed and and it's it's wonderful you don't find the lecturer commanding people meanwhile are you still with me the proof that jesus chose you to be a partaker in this lecture the proof is that he gives you commandment now if he's not giving you commandments he did not choose you the ones he chose he gave them commandment hey. uh, if you don't have any commandment to give you about how to use money it means that what you are doing as ministry the service delivery that you are bringing to the table did not stem out of obedience there's no regiment no no structure of obedience that is in your life you're not with me if he has chosen you he will give you commandments he will regulate you he will determine how you use money he will even determine how you speak on the pulpit and if you violate it you will you will lose your peace for days because the the undercurrent of what you are doing is obedience it's not a good idea you are trying to administer you are not you are not trying to be popular so you are not trying to say things that people will like now if you tell them you are blessed they will like it you may not be called to say that even though it is trending and meanwhile i need to say quickly that there is a certain lifestyle you can sustain that even a prophetic world you are blessed will not change you that word can't even rest on your life because you are deficient in obedience your life is far away from what is supposed to be obtainable if the government of god is seated over your soul so the apostles that he chose are the ones that he gives commandments a few years ago i was still um, working in the oil industry in my, in my nation and I had a posting from one location to another location. I came to the new location. And after a while, my car was stolen. I was expecting God to sympathize with me that. Now that my car, you know, has been stolen, I was expecting him to be easy on me. He now told me that <laughs> my salary in a month, those days, could buy a car. That's my monthly salary. I can go to the car shop and buy a car with my monthly salary. If any of you here have ever been to Lagos, you will notice that there are some buses there that are yellow. The Lord said I should not buy a car, I should use those buses. And you see, in the oil industry, because of the structure of our salary, that's where the big guys are. It's, 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 it's iniquity for you to come to the office without a big vehicle. You just need to. And I, I was flowing with the bus. So I, I thought that after seven months, he would have tried me enough to say, okay, go. You can get any car you want. I was in that state of yellow buses for seven years. Because it is not about what is trending. <laughs> oh, you are not with me. <laughs> the man that is willing to obey God has, is determined to be shaped by God. He is willing to be vulnerable under God's influence over his life he's willing and it is those dealings that God gives him because his government is strong over his life that gives him revelatory power in his teaching ministry a man that has not been dealt with by God doesn't have what to teach even if he attends a theological school he will be doling out letters that will kill he's not been forged in the furnace of spiritual dealings so most of what he's saying is a lie I know a time will come when you will not say amen again and i will understand <laughs> are you still with me yes. i was in those buses for seven years and i had the money 
to buy a car every other month. So this is it. First thing I want you to write is, if you ever ask, can it be done? Without asking, should it be done? You are falling. Let me, let me, those, that is the dialect of obedience that I'm using to craft these sentences. If you ever ask, can it be done? Without asking, should it be done? You are falling. Because you, you are running with ability, you are not running with government. A man under government can have ability, but he doesn't put it to work until his master gives him the go ahead. So it's not a matter of ability with him. It's a matter of whether he has the sanction of God to go ahead. So I have money to buy a car. But it should not be done. And it was not done for seven years. After seven years, he told me, you don't need to buy a car again. I will, I will give you all the cars that you need. Anytime I know you need it, I'll give you. So it was not about a car. It was about me understanding how to work with him. Even when my cerebral faculty is unfruitful as to what he wants to achieve with the dealings that he's bringing over my life. Jesus never contended or contested the authority of his father. And because of that, he had a teaching ministry that was powerful. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Second question I need to ask you quickly because the Bible says that the apostles whom he chose, he gave them commandments. Second question I need to ask you is, are you really regulated by God? Because if you are being regulated by God, the commandments he has given to regulate you will be at your fingertips. Now, if you memorize something, you will forget. But when you begin to obey a scripture, you will never forget it. Because every fiber of your being will remember. Obedience is what makes you remember. So there's so much teaching going on in church. People's lives are not changing. It's because they don't obey. Because the moment you begin to obey, you will remember. You will know why you are not eating. When you are fasting, and that voice tells you that there's yogurt, vanilla yogurt in the fridge. It, just in case you survive that temptation. It is because you know why you are fasting. That's why you survived. When you begin to journey on the path of obedience, your dialect will change. Your, what, what moves you changes. And it's men that are rooted in obedience for decades. I'm not talking about three years of obedience. If you have not paid your tithe for ten years, you don't know the power of tithe. If you have not fasted for, for 10 years, you don't know the power of fasting. No, you don't know it. You are just a churchgoer. The powers of the kingdom that you have been brought into, you, don't, you have not touched it. You are just playing around. If you have not prayed in tongues for 7 hours, for, for 10 years, you don't know the power of prayer. You don't know the power of prayer. You don't know what prayer can do. I need to ask you, what can your prayer do? You are not answering me now. What can your prayer do? Because when real prayer starts, the first thing that is considered from heaven is not what you are praying. It's who is praying. Who is this one praying? And then your file comes and they see the track, of, track record of obedience. It's obedi prayer is a tool for obedient people. It's a tool. You want to know the power of prayer? If you have not done it for 10 years, you don't know it. So we have believers all over the world that are Christians, but they have not experienced God. No, because they have not obeyed enough for him to be willing to, to show them the truth. Hmm. The Bible says, and Jesus spake unto the Jews that believed on him. They were believers. Not unbelievers, they had believed. He said, if you continue in my word, then you become chattered disciples. Become my disciples indeed. Become the disciples that me, I call disciples. The world can call some others disciples. But the one me, I call disciples, are the ones that continue in my world to understand the way I think, to understand what I expect. In order for you to be a disciple, it means you are willing to learn of the ways of God. That's why the passcode into knowing the ways of God is rooted in your willingness to obey Him. He will just say, do this. When you become foolish enough to begin to do it, then you begin to understand why He said. That's when you know the truth. And for a man that knows the truth, Satan has lost that man in terms of his enterprise of deception. He can't work on him anymore because spiritual knowledge has been revealed to him. That's why I say, if you don't know prayer, you can be praying now and Satan will come 
and make you feel depressed, make you feel that you are a failure, make you feel that you are, you are not married, your life is not shining, then you'll be discouraged and you stop praying. The reason why you were discouraged is because you don't know the power of prayer. The truth about prayer has not been revealed to you. You did not continue. You did not continue. So the average believer, and trust me, I've been a missionary for a while, not just in cities, but in villages and in towns. I can give you a good assessment of how Christianity is in this time. The average Christian does not know the truth. Because knowing the truth is not cerebral. Knowing the truth is a product of consistent obedience. Then the Lord now decides to give you something that people that just come for window shopping in the house of God will never have. Because he wants to make you different from window shoppers. You become his advertisement for deep things that are in him. Oh my. That is why he begins to give you commandments. He gives you commandments because the things he's revealing to you are dangerous. When a man is given a sword, then he needs to be under a general. Because being in possession of a sword is a dangerous enterprise. If it's not, if it's not restrained, if it's not regimented, the use of that material that is given to him will become an offense. The moment the things of the kingdom are given to you, you, you are a deadly man. The day you decide to turn your back on God, Satan will have a mighty harvest because of your life. So, he begins to give you commandments to regulate those powers that you are touching because you know the truth. Can't you see how terrible Lucifer is? There the are truths he discovered. When he turned his back on God, he's a menace till this day. So, when God begins to expose you to those things in the kingdom, then he begins to give you commandments to hold you down. To hold you down so that the kingdom will always profit from the investment that he has given you and that's why verse 2 says he gave them commandments whom he has chosen if he has not come to you to give you commandments you are not chosen yet your, your obedience is in doubt you are not qualified to know the truth where you are the truth is not available you <coughs> i know you won't say amen again truth is not there he knows you are not serious the one that created this the whole earth and then you're like you you become a mystery to him he knows he knows he knows why you are in ministry he knows what you want he knows so he will exclude you from some quarters and manage you at the outer court because if you go beyond that, ah, the way your heart is, he knows. He knows. He knows. He gave commandments unto the apostles he had chosen. That's number one. So the first thing he did to them is that he, he gave them commandments. Because the undercurrent is obedience. The things of God, he will not give you until he's sure. That it is him you are looking for. It's his will you are looking for. It's his glory you are looking for. Because he knows the nature of man. He doesn't need anybody to lecture him about how men are. Doesn't he? Doesn't need a lecture. First thing he did to them was that he gave them commandments. Second thing he did to them is in verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion second thing he did to them was that he revealed the living christ to them not the christ on the cross not the christ before the cross the christ that has manifested after death has unleashed his worst he showed himself alive to them when he knows that the reason why you are coming to him is because of him because of his purposes like jesus looking for what was on his father's heart so that he can implement the same upon the face of the earth then he will show himself alive to you now this showing himself alive to you is not in not in bible study not that he gives you a revelation in the bible no to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. These are encounters of the spirit. 
Because we are talking about greater works. You, you cannot perform greater works much more than the encounters that you have received. Stay with me, stay with me. By the time I finish teaching, are you there? I, you know, I said we'll do practicals. The reason why I'm sure that the Holy Ghost will move, whether you, you maybe you don't want him to move, he will still move. And you don't need to say amen to make him move, no. Don't worry, just be mute, he will move. Don't encourage him. He wants to move, he will move tonight. And that's not, I'm not saying it so that you say amen. No, your amen is not needed in this matter. The thing is this, if Jesus shows himself alive to you, that encounter will give you something from him and make it yours. You know, Peter made a statement when they came to the gate called beautiful. He said, silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have. What, 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 what does he mean that he has something? When he doesn't have a rand in his pocket. But he had something with God. And he could squander, he could pay for that guy's healing from the resources he had. When Jesus encounters a man, I'm talking about the living Christ. He makes you custody. He makes you custodian. He makes you a holder of the things in him. When you become a holder of some things in him, you know, Peter did not ask Jesus, should I pray for the man? He didn't ask Jesus. Because he was in possession of something. And because he was in possession of something, he could use that thing. He knew the value of that thing. He knew what that thing could do. And that thing had enough authority to take care of the man's predicament. That's how a stakeholder, a kingdom stakeholder emerges. Jesus did not say, Go and pray for the sick. Jesus said, heal the sick. He, he didn't say, go and sympathize with them with a word of prayer. <laughs> he didn't say, go there, cry, uh, call his name. He said, heal the sick. It means there is something Jesus will give you that you can use to heal. All of those possibilities are tied to encounters. That Jesus, the living Christ, will bring to you. And he will only bring encounters to the people that are foolish enough to allow him to command them. He comes into your bank account. When you said you were giving and there was a problem with the children's school fees, then I now, I shook my head. That's a proof that he is commanding you. <laughs> if you have no record, no record of commandments, it means you are not operating under his government. The cry that we find in the book of Matthew, which is the object of the book of Matthew, has not been fulfilled in your life. It has not been fulfilled. You are a rolling stone. You go in the direction of your flesh. In you, Adam is still very much alive. <laughs> you know, his pastor, pastor witness that, that brought me. You see, he's the one that caused all the problems. He brought me. <laughs> only few of us in the body of Christ, only few, have what it takes to challenge the powers that are at work among the Sangomas. Only few. So that believer that does not know the truth, and he doesn't know the truth because he, he doesn't continue anything, doesn't continue prayer, he doesn't continue fasting, doesn't continue giving, doesn't continue tithing, so he doesn't know the truth. So deception can walk around his life. And when he stands face to face with the devil, the authority of Jesus will not manifest through his spirit because his life is a contradiction of alignment. <laughs> to whom also he showed himself alive. Have you seen him? I was born in Stamara. I could not speak. I was a little bit intelligent, but I couldn't talk. It was the living Jesus that came to me and touched my tongue. How can I forget that? It was not Bible study he came to do. You are not with me. <laughs> he didn't come to open scriptures and to say, I am the way, the truth. No. I encountered the living Jesus. 
the effect of that encounter was that my tongue got loosed. That's why I can preach to you today. When Jesus said to me that he was calling me to preach the gospel, the first thing I said, because I had an encounter of glory, I was taken to heaven for eight hours. The details of that encounter is withheld. But an angel read a scroll, and that scroll was my destiny. That scroll was what I was supposed to accomplish in life. When it got to the point that I was going to preach, and I touched the angel, he said, no. God is aware of the fact that I cannot talk. So he cannot assign me to be a preacher. That aspect is not. That angel stopped reading. Unfortunately for me, the angel stopped reading. And then the angel screamed. The sound of that scream is what we call thunder. It was the energy of that thunder that brought me back to my body. So I began to beg Jesus, beg him, to beg him, to repent, to repent for years. So when he, he calculated and saw that my repentance was genuine, he now came and touched. He was angry that I couldn't see that he had the power to lose in my tongue. It is in that encounter I received the healing ministry. Have you met the living Jesus before? He was the one that taught me how to migrate, how to move from the seat of a teacher, an instructor, into the visions of God. If you know what I'm talking about, you can, you can lock everybody in this auditorium out and you are alone with Jesus. Meanwhile, there are one million people standing by your side. You can't see them. this is what I got in the place of prayer before coming now he said the average believer in Africa is not desperate enough for him he said that by now the revival he planned for South Africa would have been five years on, five years on by now. But it was shifted because the church in the land is not desperate enough for him. When you are not desperate for God, it means you have another God. It means you have another place where your confidence is. Because prayer is the dialect of the helpless. of your glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 can someone begin to speak to him right now if there are areas you need to repent you can call upon him now Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up. We need to see the living Christ shining in the light of your glory. Pour oh, out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Pour 
we miss our timings in the spirit because our hearts are not tuned to him we are overtaken by splendor and we no longer understand the look of glory open the eyes of our spirit man that we might look upon the beauty that you are we are tired of walking on crutches give us strength Under the least among us will become as strong as David. He wants to encounter you. He wants to take you beyond where you have come. Shahile mendo kubrehe si kamaha eto hobre mahamba. Return, return, that we might look upon you. Return, return, that we Oh. Return return that we might look upon you. We want to look again. For to whom he showed himself alive after his person by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God thank you Lord he wants to raise your hand so that your former sight can come to you We give you praise. We give you glory. Some people need to repent in our midst. Give you opportunities that you squandered. And tonight you want to say, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Thank you for watching and if this video has blessed you, please like, kindly subscribe and also tap on the notification bell so you can stay notified and updated on our new videos. And please do not forget to share the link to people so we can bless more people. And most importantly, we want to know how this video has blessed you under the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe.